Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. When we stopped, we're in Ephesians chapter 2. We'll pick it up at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. We had started a study in the book of Ephesians. And then last week took a little detour because we had Lord's Supper in the morning. We had baptism uh, in the evening. And both of those are rejoicing times. Really appreciate uh, what God does in a very special way at those times. So we're back to the book of Ephesians. Let's see what God has for us in His Word this day. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 11, I will read to the end of the chapter. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the, coven the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace." and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit let's pray Heavenly Father, you have taught us to read aloud your word as we gather together in your presence. Lord, we have read aloud from Psalms. We are reading aloud from Ephesians. Both are your word. What are you saying to us? What, what do you desire to convey to us? What message are we to receive from you? Lord, give us revelation, give us understanding. And once we know the desire of your heart, we ask for power to be able to put into practice what you teach us. Lord, encourage your people here this day. Break through any spiritual dullness, any doldrums that are there. Renew, refresh. Father, bless these who have gathered together in your presence these day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you all have better memories than I do, but when it says, therefore, you know, therefore means, remember what I just said. Well, that was two weeks ago. <laughs> I may have to take just a little peek and look, because it was uh, two weeks ago, whatever he's referencing. Where did we finish? Well, in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 through 10, is what we finished with the last time in our study in Ephesians. Let's go read that. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 8, proclaims this great truth. This is one of those that if you've known Jesus for a while, you begin to study your Bible, you go ahead, you underline these, you circle these, you put a star by it. You do something to bring it to your memory. You do something to to uh, draw it to your attention. The goal is to get these words off the page into your heart and put them into practice in our lives. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember... Okay, so we have to, we stopped at a certain location and it was on a high. What has Jesus done for you? Who are you in Christ? Remember the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a reminder of who you are in Jesus. Who have you been saved to be? What has God done for you? What does he desire to do on a daily basis? How do you possess the life that is certainly yours in Jesus Christ? We've discovered that what the book of Joshua does for the Old Covenant, in other words, the law is established by Moses, but then it's time to go into the Promised Land. It's time to learn how to fight those battles. How do you defeat those giants? How do you take the high towers? How do you overcome the enemy on a daily basis? How do you believe God for the next set of crops uh, that are coming in? How do you raise a family? How do you live a separated life for the Lord? And see, the book of Joshua is all about that. Having established what God declares uh, you are in him, then Joshua shows how to go into the land and to be God's people victorious on a daily basis. Well, the book of Ephesians is very similar. So what the book of Joshua does under the old covenant, the book of Ephesians does under the new covenant. How do you possess your possessions as a follower of Jesus Christ? And sometimes we have to be reminded who we are in Christ. Remember, the emphasis is that we are saints. Yes, we were sinners, and yes, every now and then we still get run over by sin. But Jesus' job is to turn sinners into saints, and he's good at it. And the Holy Spirit within you does not sin. The Holy Spirit within you does good. How often does the Holy Spirit want to do good? Every single day. What does the Holy Spirit desire to do this day in your life? To do good. Remember that little promise in Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good. If you can't remember any other marching orders on a daily basis, go back to that one. What are you supposed to do today? You are to trust in the Lord and do good. How about tomorrow? Trust in the Lord and do good. Next week, trust in the Lord, do good. Next year, trust in the Lord and do good. God keeps you around to be his ambassador, to be his witness, and you are to do good on a daily basis. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast, but good works follow the salvation experience in Christ, because the Holy Spirit within you lives holy. The Holy Spirit lives good. The great battle that Ron has in his soul is flesh versus the spirit. The old way of doing things, all that Ron is apart from Christ versus the Holy Spirit. You see, the nature of Adam has gone. The nature of Christ has come. I know how to do things the old way. You know how to do things the old way. But Jesus says, do it the new way. We are to live the Jesus side of life. And so we're learning how to live this separated life for Christ. Every man, woman, and child who is born again in Jesus is declared to be a saint, one who is sanctified by God, set aside for a holy purpose. Not some super-duper, extra-colossal, better-than-anybody-else person, but everyone who is born again in Jesus is declared to be a saint. So we are learning how to live sanctified. We are learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit. We are learning how to walk by faith. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we have to confess when we have fallen into sin, receive our forgiveness, and then we need to move on. But you are here this day to have fellowship with God. You're to trust in the Lord and you are to do good. You are here as a blessing unto others. It says, therefore, remember that this is who you were. Now, you did not learn this at, at a public school. 
and you did not learn this from the culture of man and you did not learn this from the history of your nation you learn this directly from Jesus Christ himself and that's the little reminder with a bold declaration of how God has saved us and why he has saved us he says therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh now we have had those in the congregation who have Jewish backgrounds most of us have Gentile backgrounds. You go far enough back, we are the pagans. We are those who worshiped false gods. Uh, we are those who lived in spiritual darkness. We were those who were, uh, whose lives were made miserable by demonic forces. Those who were superstitious. Those who were trying to keep evil spirits away, knowing that they were real, but not knowing how to appease them. And so you come up with all sorts of spiritual deceptions. It says, this is the background of Gentiles. The Gentiles were not in covenant with God. God chose the nation of Israel to enter into covenant with. So those who are Jewish, you know, those who are part of the old covenant, uh, it says uh, they had this unique experience in the Lord. God did a work in the nation of Israel so that through Israel, all nations of the earth would have an opportunity to come to know him. It's why we still study the history of Israel. We still study the old covenant, those promises. We actually have more if you hold up your Bible and you start counting pages. Wow, I got more in that Old Testament than I knew that New Testament. And I promise you it's all about Jesus. Uh, you can grow closer to the Lord in your study of the Old Testament. You grow closer to the Lord in your study in the New Testament. It says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, and for most of us, that's the background. We were not in covenant with God. We, we, we did not understand that revelation. We were not the chosen people of God. It says those who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Sometimes uh, we have walked with the Lord for so long it has been a while for some it's decades to be born again in Jesus and we forget just how good Jesus is and just how precious salvation in Jesus is sometimes we forget who we are what Christ has accomplished we take for granted mercy and grace and it says now remember Remember who you are and remember where you came from. Remember the great love that God has bestowed upon you. Remember this great act of love where Jesus Christ died in your place on the cross. And then there came a time in your life that God himself reached out to you and convicted you of sin, led you in repentance. When you cried out for mercy, he was right there. He forgave your sins. He came to live within you by his Holy Spirit. Now he is there forever. You have eternal life. You have forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. God Almighty is your Heavenly Father. You, heaven is your home at this very moment. There is all this has been accomplished by grace and mercy. God is the one who did this. And so when God preached to you, God reached out to you, you by faith said yes to Jesus. Everybody is given a measure of faith by creation. And it's where you put your faith that is so important in Scripture. You see, it's a faith decision that will determine where you will spend eternity. And everybody will make a faith decision linked to Jesus Christ. It can be, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, have mercy upon me. Jesus, forgive me. I see clearly now that you died in my place. To, to pay the price for my sins. I want that. Have mercy upon me. And you commit your life to Christ. You can, by faith, ignore Jesus. Reject Jesus. Pretend that uh, he's not important. Or that there are many other ways to have eternal life. Jesus boldly proclaimed. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. 
And that's quite a statement. No one from Adam to the last human being can have eternal life unless it's linked to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, it's faith in Christ that makes all that difference. And it says, remember, remember where you came from. Remember the false gods. Remember the spiritual deception that you were in. But now that is broken by the blood of Christ. Now you are filled with the Spirit of God. Now you are called to live a separated life. You lived in ignorance. You lived in rebellion. You lived in superstition. But now you're set free by the blood of Christ. Now you have a purpose. Now you know who you are, why you're here, and where you're going. So don't even waste one day living the old way. Don't even waste one day living in darkness. Don't even waste one day living in rebellion. But be led daily by the Spirit of God. It says, we, we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's a miserable place to be. Now some, if you're fairly young in Christ, you remember what it was like to have no hope and to be miserable in the world, to be in darkness, to be in confusion. You don't know who you are. You don't know why you're here. You don't know where you're going. You seem to just bounce from sin to sin. Life is so, it's, it's tough, it's hard. If it's been a long time that you have been born again in Christ, if you've been in Christ for a long time, sometimes you forget what it is to have no hope in this world, to live in spiritual darkness. Remember the multitudes that live in the neighborhoods around you, that work on the same jobs, that live in the same city, that are a part of those who reside in this valley. Do you understand that there are multitudes, multitudes in a great valley of decision here in El Paso and Juarez who have have no hope who are in spiritual darkness who can only cling to superstition you have the solution Christ in you is the hope of glory you're an ambassador for Christ you can put in a good word for Jesus somebody did for you somebody loved you enough cared enough for you to tell you about Christ somebody prayed for you somebody interceded even if you asked them not to even if you thought that they were sticking their nose in, they didn't have any business. You know, there are those, once they become burdened for another salvation, for the salvation of another soul, that they just, they just keep on praying, don't they? Grandmas are great about this. They are really good. Those who've known Christ a long time are really good about standing in the gap on behalf of salvation for folks. Constantly asking God to intervene, constantly asking God to show himself that he would break through, that that loved one would come to Christ, that loved one would be saved. Well, that happened. You went from despair to hope. You went from darkness to light. Verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were reminded last week at the Lord's Supper. And then again at baptism, it took the very death of Christ on that cross for you, for you to be saved. Nothing less. It took all that Christ had. He had to die in your place. He had to shed his blood. He who knew no sin became sin for you. And once that work was done and completed, and on the cross, God the Son paid that price before God the Father. And God the Father, in, in holy wrath, judged all of mankind's sin upon Jesus. And that's what happened on that cross. Once that price had been paid, now the way is open. The way is open for sinful man to come into the presence of holy God by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It says, don't forget. Don't forget what it took for you to be set aside, for you to be saved. And desire that for others. You and I have great hope. You and I have great hope for those that we are praying for. Because if God can get a hold of a bunch like us that are here today, we have great hope. He can get a hold of those who are on our heart, those that we're interceding for, those that we are praying for. Why? Verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace. How do you have peace with God? How do you have peace with your circumstances? How do you have peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ? It is found in Jesus. 
Peace is a person. His name is Jesus. And by abiding in Christ, by having fellowship with him on a daily basis, you can remain at peace no matter what is happening in the world around about you. You can remain at peace no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. You can remain at peace and come into God's presence if you know that things are right with Jesus. And we can come and gather here and we can be at peace with one another. Do you understand that there is a supernatural love that God gives believers for other believers? It's one of the, the assurances of our salvation. In 1 John, remember there were two things that were declared to be assurance of salvation. One is the presence of God's Holy Spirit, the deposit, the guarantee. If the Holy Spirit lives within you, you are born again in Jesus. Either the Holy Spirit's there or he's not there. And if he's there, you know that he is there. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit. The second assurance is we know that we've passed from death into life because we love the brethren. There is a supernatural love that is placed in your heart for other believers. You can't work it up. You can't buy it. You can't get it. It's either there or it's not. And I promise you in Christ it is there. You can see why the enemy is always trying to attack our peace to have us divided because he himself, Jesus, is our peace. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. In the congregation at Ephesians, in Ephesus, as, he, as Paul writes to the Ephesians, there are some who have a Jewish background, as Paul did. There are some, in fact, more uh, than some. The, the majority of them had Gentile backgrounds. Now, in the flesh... Under the old covenant, Jew and Gentile were to have nothing to do with one another. There are warnings that are there. There are laws against that. There was an enmity. There was a division. How is it possible that folks under the old covenant, those who were Jewish or those who were Gentile, not having covenant with God, having no hope, being in darkness, remember they weren't supposed to uh, marry one another and they weren't supposed to build one another up. There was an enmity there. You know, folks who were, who were Gentile, if they wanted to get right with God, they became Jewish and they entered into a covenant with God. But then under this new covenant, something very different took place. There were those who were Gentile and they came directly to faith in Christ and they became a part of the church. They became a part of the redeemed. They became a part of the saved and they never were Jewish. They had no Jewish background. When they came to Christ, when they heard the gospel preached unto them and conviction was there and they got saved, their whole background was in Zeus or in Thor or in Mercury or in Mars, the god of war, or Diana, or the, whatever gods that they, they had. And then they would worship many gods. Coming from that background, not knowing any of the old covenant, they came directly to Christ and they were saved. Whoa, what a challenge. What a challenge as they become a part of the redeemed. Because for those who had been exposed to the gospel, who had a Jewish background, you could say, remember what Daniel said. Remember Isaiah. Remember Jeremiah. Remember the work that, that God did in and through Ruth. And there were folks who they knew exactly what we're talking about. You see, salvation is of the Jews. The scripture is of the Jews. The prophets is of the Jews. My Savior is Jewish. And so you will notice they, the first, the message came to those who had the word, they, who had what we call the Old Testament. And by teaching the Old Testament, comparing to the life of Christ, and they line up and they mesh. And so he's the one who fulfills the law. Jesus is the one who fulfills the law. Jesus is the one whom the prophets foretold. And so the gospel was always preached first to the Jews. 
but then unto the Gentiles. It has always been God's heart that folks, whether they had a Jewish background or Gentile background, to come and be a part of his family, come and be a part of those who redeem, become a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking denomination. We're talking body of Christ. We're talking those who are redeemed. Things were so bad between those who had a Jewish background and those who had a Gentile background that when you went to the temple, there is a division. And when you and I study the temple, there was the court of the Gentiles that was outside. And Gentiles were allowed to walk through there and, and to meet folks and all there. But then there was a court of Israel. And then there would be court of the priests, and then you would actually go into the temple, and then you'd go into the holy place and the holy of holies. You see, and it thinned out as, as, as you got closer to the very presence of God in the holy of holies, who, who could go and who could not go. Between the court of the Gentiles and the court of Israel, there is a wall that was all the way around. A little low wall. Generally, it's described as three to four feet high. And, there, and then there would be these little openings every now and then. And bef between every opening, there was a sign that those who were not Jewish, you know, if they were to proceed, they, they, would, they would proceed under penalty of death that they had been warned. If they passed the wall, they would be slain. And they, they had been warned. This was just for those who were in covenant. This was just for those who were a part of the Jewish nation. That's what's being referenced here. There had always been that division. How do you get folks with those kinds of divisions both coming to Christ? If you have a Jewish background or a Gentile background, how do they become one? Those who had always been kept apart, how do you overcome that? And you overcome that through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus himself is our peace. Jesus is the one who tears that wall down. Jesus is the one who changes us from the inside out. It's only in Jesus that you're going to find that peace and that oneness. It has only been in Jesus that I have seen Arab and Israeli come together and love one another and bless one another and work together and not strive with one another. Because if you have Israeli come to Christ and Arab come to Christ, now they're new in Jesus. Now they have been made one. They're not two any longer. They have been made one. The solution when it comes to uh, people group problems and prejudices, how do you overcome that in Jesus? Okay, if the color of your skin is orange, if it's purple, if it's whatever color you want, you name every shade you can think of from the lightest to the darkest. And some folks have a real problem with that. They just won't get together. They don't want to get together because of that. How do you overcome that? In Jesus. All that wall comes down in Jesus. Jesus himself is our peace. How about those of different educational backgrounds? Some who use large and big words, and some of us, it's all we can do to write our name some days. You know, how, where there is a division that is there, how does that come down? In Jesus. Cultural differences, different things. How do, how do those walls come down? They come down in Jesus. Jesus himself is our peace. How do we bless our enemies? You know, there, there are nations that are our enemies. And yet in the body of Christ, they are not our enemies. Do you understand? I have brothers and sisters in Christ who are in North Korea. And we do all that we can to bless them. Now, the North Korea and the United States are enemies. That's going to remain on a national level. And yet I'll tell you that there are Americans and North Koreans because they're both born again in Jesus who are a part of the same church of God who bless one another and encourage one another. When there was such persecution that was going on uh, in Russia and behind the Iron Curtain and officially that we are, we're in a war 
There were those who risked everything to try and go and to bless others in Jesus' name because we had brothers and sisters in Christ who were behind that iron curtain. And we have brothers and sisters in Christ who were behind, quote, the bamboo curtain. We have brothers and sisters in Christ and those walls come down in Jesus. Without Jesus, we're not concerned. We're not concerned at all. But now we have a supernatural love for others. It says, remember who you are and how you should live in Christ. You see, if the church cannot demonstrate this supernatural love to those who are in darkness, why should they desire our Jesus? You see, they have no hope. They're in darkness. They're looking for the real thing. Is there somebody out there who really loves one another? Just doesn't say it, but they really put it into practice. Jesus prayed for this kind of love to be made manifest among his people. And he said, this would be a witness. He says, by this they shall know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And it's not a love that we work up. It's not a duty that we fulfill. It is placed there supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. It is part of our salvation. And we look for ways. You know, there is no division at this river when it comes to the body of Christ. We do all that we can to work across that river in the love of Christ. We have brothers and sisters uh, that love Jesus with all their heart in Mexico. And it's difficult because of the rules and regulations of men. It says this cannot be done. We look for ways. We look for biblical ways to be a blessing one to another. And I have been in Mexico and I have been in, among brothers and sisters in Christ that I've known just a short period of time. They have a great love for Jesus. I have been present with those who had so very little that uh, it, it was a very meager meal, but they wanted you to eat first and you were scared to. They're down to their last bowl of beans, but you're welcome to share that with them in Christ. Jesus is the one who is our peace. Remember who you are. Let Jesus be Jesus. Let be Je Jesus be Jesus across these barriers. There is never any compromise for moral standards. Never any compromise for righteousness. Never any compromise for holiness. Never. Jesus never compromised any of those standards and yet had ways to reach across and to take the hearts of folks who were on two different sides, but in Christ they now become a new man. Instead of two, they are one. It says, verse 17, He came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You know, Jesus and me knows how to cooperate with Jesus and you. The Holy Spirit that dwells within me knows how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. We cannot use the gimmicks of men. We cannot use the methods of men for this to be reality. Men know there is a need. But they think more information or more money or more manipulation. That's how we'll solve our problems. No, those problems will be solved in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus himself is our peace. And without Jesus, you will not have that peace. If Jesus is not included in that relationship, you will not have peace. If Jesus is not included in that relationship, you will not have peace among states, among nations, among families, among individuals. But if Jesus is included in that relationship, you will have peace. It is possible to have peace with God, peace with your circumstances, and peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you leave Jesus out, these promises are no good. If Jesus is included, then all these promises are active. Verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
If somebody were to show up and they said, I want to meet the God who created all of this universe. I want to know if there is a real God. Where do you send them? Where do you tell them where to go? There are two places described in scripture where you can meet holy God. Number one, God dwells within the spirit of the one who is redeemed. God dwells within the spirit of the one who is born again in Jesus. And so if you meet a Christian who abides in Christ, and that word means is in fellowship with Jesus, you will meet holy God. How do you meet holy God today? How do you know that God loves you? How do you hear revelation from God? The Holy Spirit desires to be that river of living water flowing out of the redeemed. Living Jesus, sharing Jesus, speaking Jesus. So our job is don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit live Jesus daily through you. Trust in the Lord and do good. So for those who are abiding in Christ, you should meet Holy God. They should be able, they're ambassadors for Christ, they're witnesses for the Lord. There should be that introduction. Where else can you experience the presence of God? In gatherings like this. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, abiding in me, in other words, in fellowship with me, there I am in the midst. You don't have to send somebody far away for them to meet God. They don't have to go to a certain location on the earth. Today, the same God we read of in Scripture is present. All that Jesus has ever been, He is at this very moment. What He has done for others, He will do for you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are reminded as followers of Christ, each and every day, we are to trust in the Lord and do good. Because Jesus himself is our peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises and we thank you for the reminders. Forgive us when we forget who we are in Christ. Forgive us when we forget who you saved us to be. Forgive us, Lord. We're asking for daily guidance and direction. We thank you for fresh starts. And Lord, if you have drawn any to this place or any are hearing these words that don't know you, we ask, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. We ask for conviction of sin. We ask that you'd lead in repentance. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for salvation. And Father, if there be some who have known you and walked with you, but for whatever reason have put you on a back burner for a while, Lord, let them return to their first love today. And may the rest of their days be an example of what God's grace and mercy can do every single day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.